Well, today on Nova Legends Podcast, I got the Glennon brothers, quarterbacks from Westfield High School, uh, great quarterbacks, uh, both all met quarterbacks, took a team to uh, state championships at Westfield, and then Sean went to Virginia Tech, Mike went to, uh, went to NC State and is still playing in the NFL. Um, welcome, guys. Hey, Julian, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Yes. Yeah, so so Sean, before we before we uh, you got on you got on today, uh, Mike and I were talking about Coach Doug Yule and my, a personal friend of mine, and I was just sharing a story of how we met. He's such a great guy, um, and uh, you know he recently stepped down uh, at, at Westfield. I know you played basketball uh, for Coach Yule, and, and so did Mike. Uh, what are your thoughts about Coach Yule stepping down? And generally, um, you know, tell us tell us a little bit about Coach Yule. I, I was. I was bummed to hear it. Uh, you know, one of the things I look forward to every year is, uh, and my daughters is I take them to one of Coach Yule's basketball games, and he kind of gives them the VIP treatment. You know, lets them be on the court during pregame, and and uh, you know, sit on the bench while the while the teams are warming up and stuff like that. So that was always something we looked forward to, and and uh, you know, I loved going back and seeing seeing Coach Yule and seeing what it was. It gave me an excuse to go back to Westfield because I never do really other other than that and so uh from that selfish standpoint I was bummed and and uh was always good catching up with him getting the stories on how his team was going to be this year and, and getting a scoop on the you know the lay of the land of, of Northern Virginia so I, I was bummed to hear it but um you know the good news is he'll be available to uh get a few more tea times out there with me and stop by stop by the house and see the kids a little bit more often so I'll, I'll get to hang out with them a little bit more now yeah he doesn't need too many excuses to, to go play some golf uh, but, but Sean, so, um, and Mike and I were just talking, you were there when coach Yule was a JV coach and he, and he, he yes. became the varsity coach when my coach, Co coach McKeg, uh, step, step, step down or became an administrator. And then, and then Mike, so you, you played for coach Yule when he was more experienced as a coach. What are your memories of, of coach when you played for him? Yeah, I think he had a great job. He did a great job, um, kind of giving tough love, uh, you know, practices weren't easy. He was hard on the guys, but every, he earned everyone's respect. Um, I can remember early mornings in the off season, us showing up and him running, you know, you know, we would do drills and all that. But, uh, you know, I'd obviously known Coach Yule from Sean's time there and had always looked up to him and, and um, was excited to have the opportunity to play for him one day. And um, he, he was just a great coach. Like I said, I just think he does a great job getting the most out of his players. And you kind of saw that throughout his entire career. And, um, you know, he'll go down as one of the best coaches in, in Westfield history. You know, when I think of Westfield coaches, I think most people probably think of Coach Yule and Tom Urbanek. Um, so he, he's had a had a hell of a career. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he's looking forward to uh, what's next. Yeah, and besides, you know, helping to develop great athletes like you guys, you know, you want a state championship. You know, that's one thing no one can ever take away from you. I mean, you guys know what that's like from winning football championships. But, you know, as a coach, that's, that's what you dream about. That's, that's, you don't get paid a lot. That's why you do these things. So, um, well, look, yeah, I think uh, you kind of turned Westfield into uh, from a football school into also a basketball school. And I think, you know, he's the main reason behind that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, well, look, guys, like like all great football players and all quarterbacks, you guys are from Texas. Um, so uh, your, your early years were at Texas. I know at some point you guys moved to New Jersey and I think back to Texas. Uh, tell, tell, me, tell us a little bit about growing up in Texas and whether that had any effect on, on your success in football. I mean, you know, we all know from the movies and just, you know, being sports fans, how serious football is in Texas. Yeah, it was, it was different. Um, <laughs> you know, Mike moved away from Texas when Mike was still at a relatively young age. So um, he didn't probably get quite the taste of it like I did. I, I went through seventh and eighth grade in Texas and in seventh and eighth grade, at least there. And, and I think it's not unique to just Texas. I think definitely uh, some areas of the country have this. You kind of like start playing for your high school in seventh grade, if that makes sense in terms of like, you have the, the same schedule uh, there, there's cuts, right. You get the tryout for the team. They have off season programs, stuff like that. So I went through that in seventh and eighth grade. Um, where like the seventh grade team would play on Mondays, the eighth grade team played on Tuesdays, then like the freshman play Wednesday, JV played Thursday, varsity played Friday. So it was kind of like um, you, you felt like at least part of the, the high school program. And um, I stopped playing uh, baseball. I used to play baseball in the spring 
And I stopped playing baseball in seventh grade because we had an off season football program, uh, even, even in seventh grade. And, uh, you know, a quick, funny story, I'm sure we'll get to for Bannock, but when I finished my uh, freshman year at Westfield, um, you know, I knew I was going to play basketball in the winter and we have kind of our end of year meetings with the coach, you know, kind of give you your assessment and what to work on stuff like that. And so I was shaking coach for Bannock's hand, leaving. And I said, coach, when does a uh, spring football start? And he kind of, cocked his head and was like what are you talking about I was like well I'm going to be playing basketball so I just want to see if it like overruns or if I'm gonna have plenty of time to you know be be there for the whole spring football or off-season football program and he just kind of laughed at me and just kind of said Sean you, you ain't in Texas anymore we don't we don't have that up here so uh it's it's definitely taken very very seriously like I said from seventh grade on you're you're, you're you have the opportunity to almost uh prepare your, your football career year-round um you know, Friday Night Lights, you know, Mike uh, definitely probably remembers us going to our, our local high school, which was the Woodlands uh, football games, big crowds there, stuff like that. So uh, you got a taste of it. But, um, you know, I don't want to short Virginia either. I mean, I thought we had, you know, really good crowds and and, uh, you know, maybe we don't take it as seriously as some of the southern schools. But, um, you know, I felt like Northern Virginia football, D.C. metro area football was still, you know, pretty big time. And, you know, if you look at the landscape of the country in terms of um recruits you know a lot you know northern virginia uh definitely a hotbed uh you know penn state recruits here well uh, alabama recruits up here clemson um you know there's a there's a lot of schools that are that are uh, putting their attention on this area yeah yeah, yeah i think sean kind of is right i was young i was only in uh, third and fourth grade when we were there but I still played football and remember how big of a deal it was to kind of watch the uh, what, what Sean talked about. From He was in middle school, but we would go to the high school football games. Um, and the quarterback at the time was a guy, what was his name? Sean Chance Mock. Ch- Chance Mock I mean, went to Texas. Yeah. Chance Mock went to Texas. He was like one of the highest rated quarterbacks. And I thought he was like a god, you know. And, and we would actually, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we got like season tickets to the football games and we sat in the same seat like right yeah. it wasn't just general admission it was you know we had our assigned seats and we would go every week and you drive around town and every everyone in their yard would have like the woodlands football player big sign i mean it's kind of like varsity blues varsity to blues yeah. And, yeah uh the cheerleaders would have their signs you know it was uh it was definitely a bigger deal there than it is in virginia but i think to sean's point there's a lot of good players that come out of Virginia um but I remember Sean they would talk about like lifting there's kids in his like seventh grade class that were already squatting like 300 pounds which <laughs> to this day I don't think I've ever put on my back uh, and hey know, Mike don't so, forget we had a Knox football home of a Knox football player sign in our front yard yeah. too don't forget yeah. about that <laughs> um, so it's definitely a big deal there and it's kind of I feel like you're um you know everyone wants to be a part of it and I'm sure the kids there feel it at a young age. And, you know, when you're, when you're the age I was, I wanted to grow up and, you know, play football for the Woodlands. Yeah. But does it take any of the love away? I mean, like Mike, if you would have been, if you would have been raised in, in those years, Sean was in Texas, do you think your development would have been any different? Um, is it almost too serious sometimes? Um, I think that's a better question for Sean, but I think, you know, it's a big deal. Like, you know, you just re- reference coaches don't make a lot of money. And the town we lived in, the coach was the highest paid coach in the country. Um, <laughs> and there was some politics involved. I remember my parents were glad we got out because there was another kid there that played quarterback. And I believe his parents were like big boosters. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think that was going to play a role in Deshaun's career there. So it was probably good we got out. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Weldon Willig was the head coach at the Woodlands, and he was the highest paid state employee uh, in all of Texas. Um, he didn't like Coach Verbana and Coach Yule like they teach, right? Like uh, Coach Yule's a PE teacher and Verbana, you know, uh, taught like sociology and history and stuff. Coach Willig in, in the Woodlands, he just coached. That was his job. He was, he was the head football coach, and he didn't have to teach. He didn't have any other responsibilities. Um, so it is, it is kind of crazy. Like looking back, uh, Mike brought up varsity blues. It's like one of our favorite movies and, you know, they sensationalize it in that movie a little bit, but not a lot, but they, <laughs> they do it a little bit, but not a lot. Like, you know, I know that, uh, 
the, like I said, like Mike said, they put a billboard right in front of um, the quarterback's house in Varsity Blues. They didn't have a billboard, but they had a, you had a big sign that said, you know, home of, you know, Sean Glennon, uh, the Woodlands, you know, football quarterback and stuff like that. So it was, um, it was very sensationalized. You almost, a lot of guys almost just went on the football team just to almost for like social, right. Just to say that a part of it, because the football team at least didn't have cuts, right. You could be on the team, you know, you may never play. You might be, you know, buried on the depth chart, but you, you, you're on the team. And I feel like there were a lot of guys, even when I was in seventh and eighth grade that just played football, just so they could say, you know, they played football, you know, even if they weren't any good, but um, in terms of you asked about development, I think it couldn't hurt. The, like I said, we had an off season, we had a spring football. So you're playing more football. You're, you're, you're doing it more. Whereas in Virginia, like, you know, other than August to November, you know, you're not playing football. Now I know that's changed a lot now these days with seven on seven and stuff like that, but we didn't have that. So I, I think that all that stuff couldn't hurt um, our development. It probably would have helped, but as Mike mentioned, more competition, you know, I mean, obviously Mike and I were pretty good. So you, you hope the cream would arise to, to the top, but there's always a chance that, um, you know, we would have got beat out. Uh, as Mike said, uh, the guy that ended up playing for the Woodlands who would have been the same age as me was pretty good. Uh, got some small division one offers and stuff like that. So you, you just don't know. Um, when it comes to that. So the competition, very high. There's probably a lot of really good players that never got their shine in Texas, but um, you know, you just play more football. Yeah. You know, one, one thing that, uh, that, remi- that reminds me of is the fact that it's, it's, there's more specialization in general in sports, not just with quarterbacks or football, but with basketball, with soccer, any sport, you, you very rarely have two or three sport athletes, maybe two, almost never three. Um, do, do you guys, uh, for, for quarterbacks, is it, a, is it a big advantage to specialize and train all year for that? Or did you guys gain um, competitiveness and other attributes, leadership attributes by, by being on a basketball team and doing other things, playing baseball? Um, so what do you guys think about the specialization that goes on today? You want, you want to start, Sean? Yeah, I mean, I, get, I was going to let you start because I'm very passionately against what's going on uh, mm-hmm. today. So I have a I have a polarizing stance on it that um, I actually hate specialization. I, um, I know personally, I'm going to be probably a controlling parent and that I, I don't want my kids to um, specialize in anything, at least not early, you know, maybe in high school and stuff like that. But uh, I think it's ridiculous that um, I'm hearing some parents saying, you know, by like 10 years old, their kids are being kind of forced to choose one sport because of travel and falling behind and stuff like that. Um, I was a better football player because I played basketball. I was a better basketball player because I played baseball. I was a better baseball player. You know what I mean? It was kind of like a, uh, um, I think that skills build other skills, um, you know, golf and tennis and, uh, you know, you're, you're picking up eye hand coordination, you know, fitness, athleticism from, from all those things that just, that can't hurt, um, a quarterback. And, uh, I, I think I sent this to Mike and, and our cousin, they did this, uh, there was like a tweet when it was like the second round of the playoffs. It was like, you know, it was showing just the um, the quarterbacks that were left, Mahomes, Josh Allen, Burrow, Stafford, et cetera. And all of them, except one, all eight of them, except one were three sport varsity athletes in high school. And one of them was two, right? Tom Brady was included on that list. Um, and to me, that was like, you know, a very good, uh, if, anytime someone's having an, an argument with me about why specialization is good, I feel like I'll just send them that um, tweet because I, I felt like that spoke volumes. But uh, I, I don't like it personally. I mean, I chose to play basketball my senior year, even after I was already committed to Virginia Tech and I knew I was going there because I knew it was just, basketball is just going to be good for my my fitness, my feet, right? My quickness, uh, um, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I just felt like it would, would it was better to do that than to do nothing at all. So I'm very much against it. Uh, I think Mike will probably echo me, maybe not as you know passionately. But, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm I'm very against it as well. I think Sean kind of hit on all the points, but it, without the other sports, I know for a fact I wouldn't be the uh, quarterback I turned out to be. And although I'm not a great athlete, I think without basketball, I don't think I would have ever gotten to the level I did 
as a quarterback because so much of basketball footwork translates to quarterback. Um, and as, like I said, as bad as an athlete as I am, I would be even worse without it. And <laughs> I remember in the summer leagues, like my dad used to make me play point guard. And the whole point of it was so I would be going against quick guys and that would help me develop quicker feet. Mm -hmm. And um, I just don't think it's right to specialize in a sport. I think kids get burned out when you do that. Um, yeah. And I think it's just good to play multiple sports, good to play team sports, good to maybe do an individual sport. We mostly just did team sports our whole life. But um, like you said, the leadership side of it, and it's just fun. I mean, it's just being a kid. It's, it's good to experience all those different things. And I played uh, football, basketball, baseball until high school. Then I just played football, basketball. And then unlike Sean, I stopped playing basketball after my junior year. I didn't play my senior year. That was more because I thought I was going to have a chance to play as a true freshman and really wanted to kind of focus on that to get ready to go get I, I was a skinny guy and um, I sh really struggled with my weight when I played basketball. So I thought it'd be good to start trying to put on weight in case I played, which I didn't. But um, I would uh, with my kids, I, I really hope it's not to a point where uh, you have to specialize in sport because I don't think it's good for them. Yeah. And it's, and it's definitely not as fun and you lose your love for that one sport sometimes. And then, and then what, what do you have then? Um, exactly. were you, were you, yeah. Were, you, were your parents athletes? My mom was, my dad was a little bit, uh, hey. I think he was a very late bloomer. Uh, tell him Mike, so he, tell him about did. the Mustangs. <laughs> yeah, he played, uh, he, I think he played seventh grade football and that was the extent of his football career, mm. but, uh, he's actually a decent athlete. Um, I think our dad could take on any other 65 year old dad in the country <laughs> no competition doubt. right now. Uh, he could definitely beat me and he still does CrossFit every day. And that's probably where we got some of our work ethic from. Um, and then our mom was a very good high school athlete. Didn't play in college, but played all the sports um, in high school. And uh, her side of the family is very athletic. Her, her dad, her grandpa um, both played football at Lehigh. And her grandpa was a, a tremendous all-around athlete, uh, football, wrestling, track, lacrosse. I think cool. he's in the Lehigh Hall of Fame. So I think that's where most, most of our athleticism came from. Yeah. And my and guess her, brother, is, her brother played football at Duke as well. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, my guess is because because your father didn't focus on sports, he probably wasn't very tough on you guys in, in terms of being a, a, a football parent, was he? Not at all. Um, he was, you know, probably as good as you could have been in terms of the happy medium of yeah. he was always there constantly to be a set of hands or, you know, a rebounder or, you know, go out and throw the baseball or pitch, you know, do whatever we needed to do, whatever we asked of him. He was 100 percent. It was there and he coached most of our little league teams and stuff like that. So he was the ultimate always present father but he never pushed us like never once was it like sean you need to go outside and we need to throw the football or you need to go shoot 100 baskets or you need to do your push-ups and pull-ups um that that was never part of the equation and sometimes i you know my daughter's only five and sometimes i even check myself because i'm like <laughs> kind of nudging her to do something like hey let's go out and do this do that whereas I, I think truly our, our, our dad let us lead, you know, he would stay out there for five hours if we asked him to, but he would never say, Hey, we need to go outside and do this. Um, so he was, he was great in that sense that um, the, the motivation, the self-motivation had to come from myself and Mike, but in terms of always having someone to, like I said, throw to shoot with uh, you know, throw some balls, uh, batting practice, we you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, he was always uh, there hundred percent. Never, never was too busy to do that. Well, my guess is because of that attitude and kind of laid back and more of a supportive role, he didn't really choose Westfield, which was probably a new school. He didn't probably choose it intentionally because of football. Like when I do these podcasts with, with uh, lots of the old, especially the older athletes, their parents chose a district to move into when they moved into Fairfax County as the county was growing. But it sounds like to me, you guys just kind of ended up in the Westfield district. district. 
Yeah, uh, yes and no. I guess I'll feel that because I when we moved, it was more about me because I was going into high school, whereas, you know, Mike was still in fourth grade when we moved to Virginia and stuff like that. But um, Westville was not chosen necessarily for football, but it was chosen. Uh, it was chosen on purpose because of it being a new school um, and because of, you know, pulling from multi, you know, it was coming people that would have gone to Centerville, Chantilly, Herndon, um, were all pulled into Westfield. And, and my parents did that specifically because they thought it would help me and then my sister the next year kind of acclimate better, like where we didn't feel so much like a new kid, you know, if that makes sense. And then also a little bit sports related, um, Westfield the first year did not have a senior class. So the opportunity for, you know, freshmen and sophomores to play like JV and varsity early was a lot more prominent because um, uh, because we, we didn't have a senior class. But it, it wasn't because of football program. There was no football program, right? There was no history there. We, you know, no one knew how good or bad West Hill was going to be because I, I showed up when it was a brand new school um, just opening. I was on rocks at Bull Run Elementary School. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we couldn't even practice at Westfield our first our first camp. We were at Bull Run Elementary School. And yeah, the, the funny story that we always tell, like we had it so rough, is like uh, we had a line up like every five yards, the players before every practice, and we'd walk across the whole length of the field, put rocks, because there's so many rocks on the field in our helmets, and then dumping them over the over the fence at the end of the I was gonna tell his grandkids that one day. <laughs> yeah, you know, instead of like, yeah, we walked uphill three miles to school in the snow. I'll say, hey, we got we had to pick up rocks off of our our football field. Well, one thing uh, Westfield had a legendary coach, Tom Brabanek, who well, I haven't met. I know most of the old time coaches, but he was kind of after a little bit after my time. Um, what was he like as a coach? Uh, what was his style? Uh, what did you guys learn from him that, that stayed with you um, over time? I think it was just the culture he created. Um, it was like everyone was completely all in on everything that he said and 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 bought into and one of these things to think about and I know Sean did it because he did it all the way through we had these things called pride runs so I think the first week we had like four of them it was like four sprints yeah. it was almost like reverse thinking as the season went on we would add one every week so by the time we got to the state championship and we were doing a lot of these sprints and it was like you know kind of thinking shouldn't we be saving our body at the end of the year but um you know, just everything he did. I mean, guys just respected him so much. Um, and that is why, particularly me, our team was nowhere near as talented as some of the teams in the state. But it was the, the coaching that we had um, that I really think made us win the state championship and be so successful because, you know, we would go down to Oscar Smith and they would have 10 D1 players on their team and I was really the only one on ours and we would win. And I think that was just because coach Rubanic would out coach them. And, and we didn't crazy enough. We ran like 10 to 15 pass concepts and it was the exact same offense that Sean ran and there was not much to it, but we just executed it really well. Everyone knew their assignment and we would go out and execute what we were supposed to do. And um, I think that's just a credit to the uh, culture that he built there. Yeah. Sean, do you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, I mean, he, he was uh, definitely echoed what I would a lot of what I would have said. Uh, the culture was the big thing. You, you bought in. Um, you, you, you know, I'm sure it's typical for high school kids to be kind of like rolling their eyes or talking behind the back of the coach of oh, this, this is stupid or that's stupid. But you, I, I don't really recall any of that. It was just kind of like what he was selling, we were all buying um mike is right our our playbook was not complex first of all coach Rubanic is the most technology illiterate person ever so <laughs> our entire our entire playbook was him drawing the plays on a piece of paper and photocopying them for for everyone we really probably had 20 to 25 plays that we just that was it um that we ran you know you knew you didn't have to like probably game plan too much for us. We, we did what we did. Um, there wasn't going to be a lot of nuance or, uh, Oh, this particular game, we're going to start doing this different or that different. It was like, you know, we're coming at you with the same stuff we've been coming at everyone else with. 
um, you know, try to stop us. We're just going to execute well. You know, he was – Coach Rabanek was always the, old, like, pseudo O-line coach, and so he was very involved with blocking schemes and stuff like that. And, you know, we were going to run the ball at you. I mean, as crazy as it sounds, you know, um, obviously Mikey and myself were – Division one quarterbacks all met, and I had a fantastic wide receiver. Mikey had some pretty good ones. I averaged throwing the ball 14 times a game my senior year. You know, we did what we did. We were we were going to run downhill. We were going to be under center. I, I never took a shotgun snap my entire high school career, which is obviously blasphemy in, in today's day and age. But um, he was he was very uh, convicted. You know, it almost reminds me that I remember the Titans scene where he. Like the guy was questioning, like, there's only six plays in this whole playbook. Uh, and he just kind of said, you know, we do what we do. We do it well and try to stop us. And that was that was Urbanic's philosophy as well. Well, one thing you hear about nowadays with coaches, and I've talked to some coaches that, that retired, and they said as time went by, the demands on coaches increased. They did more like analytics. They, they study more and more tendencies. Um, do you think that Verbanic could still be successful today and as time goes on? Do you think – do you think execution and culture is, is the most important thing that a, a coach can bring a high school football team? I would imagine he would have evolved some now. Cause I mean, he's, he still was coaching at Flint Hill just up to a few years ago. And I don't know what they were doing schematically. I imagine he probably evolved some with the now RPO game. Like I feel like I imagine in high school, you kill people with that. Um, so I think he would have evolved, but he was successful at Flint Hill. I mean, when I was in school, Flint Hill was terrible at football. And I believe when he went there, they won, like, I don't know if it's a state championship or whatever it is for the private leagues, but I, I think they won it. Yeah. So I think he just has a way of motivating 14 to 18-year-old kids, and he gets everyone on the same page. And, um, you know, it, it was just – it was a feeling of you didn't want to let him down and um, – just everyone respected him um, as a coach. I mean, it wasn't like it was a super friendly, like I don't think anyone would say he was our friend, um, but he was a, he was our coach and, you know, he had all of our respect. Did you watch a lot of films? Did you guys have detailed scouting reports or did you just focus on how you guys were going to play? We really didn't. There wasn't a whole like, lot of we, like once or twice a week, Mike, I don't know if it was the same for you, but it was like, maybe Tuesdays and Wednesdays, you could go into <laughs> this dungeon <laughs> to eat, eat your lunch uh, where they were watching watch film. film. But you look back was, now, and I'm like, I don't even know what we were watching. <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. It was like, never you – know. it was not until college I realized, oh, you can have a wide view, right? It was always like yeah. the, the line, right? You could never – Whatever yeah. route the receivers were running, you couldn't see it. Whatever coverage the safeties and corners were in, we couldn't see it. So it, it was, I, I mean, I used to show up just because, well, A, I didn't really care about like eating lunch with in the cafeteria. Um, it was almost actually kind of nice. You ate lunch with your buddies in like this, you know, smaller controlled room. But I, I remember when I was watching the film, he focused all on like the offensive line and blocking and stuff like that. And that is VCR. And like I already told you, Vermont's not very good at technology. So it's not like it was a very efficient film session either. Um, but it was, you know, do you know what I'm saying, Julia, where it's like, there's a, like when we're in college, there was always the, like this, the, like wide all field view where you, where you see, see all 22 players on the field. And then there's like the condensed where we really only saw the front, you know, seven. Like you're watching uh, TV, like, like you're watching CBS NFL football exactly. on Sundays. Like watching TV at back best. then, it was at best. It was even more, it was even yeah. more folks. Yeah, I terrible mean, quality. Was our friend's dad was the camcorder <laughs> guy. <laughs> so, no, uh, I, if I had to answer the question in a, in a sentence, we did not do a ton of um, prep. There was not a lot of scouting reports. It was never like I went into a game knowing that, like, okay, Hernan's going to do this, Centerville's doing this, Robinson's going to do this, watch out for this, watch out for that. Like I said, it was kind of like we do what we do. Verbatic, I never read coverages. We always read a person. In, in our route concepts, it was like, whatever the outside linebacker does, if he does this, you throw it here. If he does that, you throw it there. Like, that was it. That was that, that was a, a whole um, scheme. So it's, even though it sounds very simple, I mean, obviously, it's very effective. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's, that's awesome. So let's go, uh, uh, Sean, to your career. 
what, what was your progression? Did you, did you play varsity right away? And I, I know it ended great. You, you, you won a state championship, but tell us a little bit about the progression of your high school career. Um, so freshman year, I probably had one of the most unique football experiences of like anyone ever. Uh, again, we have no senior class. Mm -hmm. We have a relatively small junior class because juniors actually had the option to stay at their high school if they wanted to. Right. So we probably only had like two thirds of a normal junior class. Then we have full, obviously, freshman and sophomore. Um, there was a pretty good uh, guy. His name was Mike Cook. He played. He was the varsity quarterback our first year. And then myself and another individual, his name was Greg Lannis, were both freshmen. And we were both pretty good. Greg was pretty good. And so I used to, for, for an entire season, my poor parents who had to come to all these games. And Mikey, I apologize if you were coming to all these games, too. I don't remember. Um, I dressed for every single freshman JV and varsity game that entire season. Now I didn't really play any varsity other than like garbage time. Um, and we didn't have much of that because we were usually getting our ass kicked, but um, the freshman, I was basically the freshman quarterback. Um, I would get me and uh, Greg would play more JV than I would, but I'd play maybe like a third of the game on JV. And then, like I said, I was really just there varsity for emergency situations if Mike were to have gotten hurt. But so, you know, whatever games, however many games we played, 10, I guess it was, you know, I, I, was, I dressed for 30 football games that, that season. Um, so, uh, again, I, I apologize to my parents and to Mike and Katie if they had to go to all 30 of those because I'm sure it was pretty boring after a while. But um, so that, that's, that was my freshman year is I – um, I wasn't, you know, I was still probably making my footprint. I was the new kid. Greg was a kid who had lived in the area forever. And, you know, was kind of well known by the coaching staff, even before he got to Westfield. So I was kind of up against it a little bit and that, um, you know, he was, he was pretty good. And, and like I said, I was the new kid, but I did. What's okay. His last name? Did, you, did you say Greg's last name? I'm not sure if I caught it. Well, uh... Lannis. Okay. LA and then yes his dad was actually a coach at Westfield for a long time okay. um then anyway so then sophomore year comes around Mike the varsity quarter from year four decides to just focus on basketball he was a good basketball player you know playing in college um and so it's just me and Greg competing I guess by the end of camp they still didn't see a clear winner so we we split time in the first game of the season second game of the season gets canceled because of 9-11 Hmm. And next week I was the solo starter, you know, Greg wasn't there. So I played every snap of the next game. And it just so happened to be the highest scoring game in Virginia high school league history. We went into oh. five over overtimes with Annandale high school, ended up losing on a blocked extra point in the fifth overtime. We lost 69 to 68. Um, but the next morning I was on the front page of the Washington post sports section and, um, you know, I guess things just kind of took off from there. I ended up having a pretty good sophomore year, um, you know, uh, you know, a very good junior year and then a very, very good senior year where we, where we won, won the States. And, um, you know, so that but that's how it got to that point in terms of, um, you know, early on in, in, in my experience with that. But, yeah, it was great. Freshman year was crazy. I, mean, I, I, I played uh, or at least dressed for a lot of football games. When you guys ended up winning state, I guess it was only what the fourth year in the school history. Um, that, that must have been a magical season. What are your memories about that season? Well, it was, it was definitely a magical season. And, and, you know, looking back, that season was as fun as I've had in football, you know, maybe ever. I mean, I had some successful teams at Virginia Tech, too. That was a lot of fun and a good ride. But, you know, some about just with your buddies in high school and, um, you, know, and you know, playing in front of all your you know, hometown fans and parents and students and stuff like that. It was, it was just a, a real fun ride. But to be honest, it wasn't like this Cinderella run or anything like that. Like we were supposed to win. Like we were supposed to be good. We went undefeated the previous year and then got bounced early in the state playoffs by a team we had already beat uh, during the season. So junior year kind of ended on a, like we didn't live up to our expectations. No. And then with myself, with Eddie, with Evan Royster, we had Lewis Corum. I mean, we had some players. And um, like I said, even though it was, it was a ton of fun and a great ride, it was almost like we didn't win. Like it would have been a huge, huge disappointment because we were, 
we were very talented. And so um, anything less, I think, than a state championship would have almost been looked at as, as a uh, unsuccessful season. Yeah. Hey, Mike, do you remember that the uh, state championship that Sean won? Is that, was that a special moment for you to see your, your big yeah, brother? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, I idolized those guys. I would wear Sean's jersey to like my middle school on game <laughs> days and do all of that. So we were down. I mean, I still remember it against, in Richmond Stadium against Percy Harvin and Lansdowne. And I think they were the same exact, I think they were in their fourth year of existence as well. Mm. Um, and it was a huge deal. I felt like I just won the state championship. And um, so it was a uh, yeah, special time. And, um, you know, it was fun to watch Sean and Eddie and, and that whole group. I mean, they were, they were a really good, really good team. Yeah. Well, let, well, let's fast forward to your high school career. So you must have had pretty huge expectations on you after Sean had done so well. And then, you know, he was playing at Tech, you know, starting quarterback at Tech. So by, by the time you got to, to Westfield, were you the heir, heir apparent? And, um, yeah, so my – so obviously Sean graduated, and so no one had played behind him. And so I'm four years behind him, so I was in eighth grade, about to be a ninth grader. And um, I, I don't – I wouldn't say I was really in the competition, but I think it was pretty obvious that I was going to be um, the quarterback there at some point because I could already throw the ball and um, just, you know, I'm sure with my last name it probably helped to follow him but my freshman year I started on JV um, and then as I mentioned to you earlier off the, off the podcast but uh, I was growing like crazy um, so I was 6'1 132 and then by my sophomore year I was 6'5 but in the midst of that I guess I was growing so quick that I I was throwing a lot at training camp and I actually broke a growth plate in my elbow which I don't even I, I don't even know what that is now but I guess I was just growing so fast that my I was like a lot of elastic or something and it broke so I missed a good portion of my freshman season um and it wasn't really the same after it and then my sophomore year I started the first game of the season but that we got a transfer um from Chantilly named Josh Whitmer and uh we kind of were competing. I won the job, but we split time. And then he kind of ultimately won the job. But I played a little bit my sophomore year. This was on varsity. And then by uh, really that sophomore spring, I think it was um, pretty obvious um, that I would be able to, you know, kind of take over. So then I started my junior and senior year. And we went 11-1 um, and one my junior year. We lost Chantilly in the regional championship. And then obviously my senior year, we went um, undefeated. I won them all. So it was, uh, it was a great, great run. And I could attest to Sean that my favorite years of my life on the football field were at Westfield um, with your friends. When you become, get to college, it becomes a business. When you get to the NFL, it becomes even more of a business. I think in my one year at Westfield, well, both years combined, I probably have won more games at Westfield than I have in my entire NFL career. <laughs> and, you know, my one winning senior season would probably make up for about five of my seasons in the NFL. So it was, you know, it was a lot of fun, um, unbelievable memories. And, uh, you know, I'd feel like we kind of lived out what every kid's dream of high school football is, is to, you know, to be the quarterback of your, your high school team and win the state championship. So it was a lot of fun. <laughs> It is amazing. Your guys' careers were so similar in high school. I mean, you ended off incredibly well. Uh, you know, you got upset or at least knocked off uh, relatively early in your junior year. And uh, so it's just, it's just incredible how your, your careers married each other. Yeah, it was um, – uh, there was a lot of – a lot of people on Sean's team have brothers that were my age as well. So it was they kind played of – like the same team. position too. Yeah, like the center – Sean's center, his brother was my center. Um, and there was tight, tight end, end. There was the same lineman. It was just uh, – so it was like we saw him win one when we were in eighth grade, and then we did it when we were seniors. So it was kind of a cool cool moment for all of us. Yeah, that's great. Qu uh, quickly, uh, uh, could we just, uh, uh, Mike, talk about your basketball career? I know you didn't play your senior year, um, but your, your uh, conference, your district, Concord, was crazy competitive, and it was for Sean as well. Uh, did you have some fun times playing in, the, in uh, basketball in that league? Yeah, I did. I, I was just an average high school basketball player. I was probably our sixth or seventh man. 
come in, play good defense, play hard for Coach Ewell. And, um, yeah, we – so Scotty Reynolds was a couple of years – he was kind of in between me and Sean, I believe. So I never personally played against him. Um, but I remember we went down to Richmond and played Benedictine, I think they're called, and a guy named Ed Davis yeah. was on there. He went on to play at Carolina. Mm-hmm. And Coach Ewell had me start that game because I think he wanted someone that would kind of, you know, play hard against this guy. And I quickly yeah. learned that I have – I mean, I didn't plan on playing college basketball, but I learned there was no shot. I would – I was even close to good enough. Um, but it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Football – I mean, they're two totally different sports, but basketball is just a lot of fun um, to play. And it was always, you know, going from football to basketball, you'd be so out of shape. Uh, you know, football shape is completely different from basketball. So I just remember going there, you'd be – exhausted because those guys had already been playing a couple weeks we would be in the playoffs and then go and play um but i really enjoyed my time as a basketball player it's a lot of fun to get out there on the basketball court that's great um well sean quickly uh let's go back to your basketball career um you know your your conference was it was just as crazy then probably even crazier because i think afterward people the uh the better players began to transfer more to private schools to play basketball as, as time went on so you caught uh, you caught some really good seasons um, in the in the Concord. Tell us a little bit about your basketball career, and also I think you, you played baseball for Westfield as well, right? No, I didn't play baseball. Okay. I, um, like I said, I gave up baseball in seventh grade because Texas offered that like off season football program in the spring. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and uh, I, I mean I was just okay at baseball. It wasn't great, so I I felt like I could let that go and I and I loved basketball I was pretty good at it and like I said I really felt there was some big benefits to playing basketball in terms of how you know they crossed over and you know at that age I wasn't really sure what was going to be my sport because I was I was pretty good at basketball at a young age um but so no I did not play baseball at Westfield uh basketball at Westfield um I played for coach Ewell my my sophomore year I was on JV um and we went we went undefeated. Uh, it was it was a fun year. Um, but there was actually a, a really quick funny story. Is we we played Centerville uh, in the middle of the season, and we uh, it sounds crazy to say this, we tied them. We went to overtime. We went into like four overtimes, and every overtime ended. You know, there was no winner, and then they just had to you know had to call it because they got the varsity team has to play like you know i can't imagine all the fans how much they hated watching had to keep watching the stupid jv game um <laughs> that happened and so apparently coach yule and the coach made like a, an agreement that he never told the players until after the game that like whoever wins the second centerville game which was our last game of the season uh wins you know gets credit for both wins and and so we're undefeated technically right one tie but, it, but that last game was worth two and I remember we were down at halftime we weren't playing very well and your man Doug I mean he laid into <laughs> us in a halftime locker room laid into us like you know Yule was always tough on us but this was a different level and but now looking back I know why like he, you know so much was on the line you know he's going to get his first undefeated season you know he was probably being groomed to be the varsity head coach wanted a nice resume boost um and um, we, we were, you know, it was two wins, two games rolled into one. So, um, so I played that sophomore year. We were good. Uh, junior and senior year, I played on the varsity under Coach McKegg, who I really loved. I really liked Coach McKegg a lot. It sounds like you, you know Bob as well. Funny guy. Um, yeah, I really liked Coach McKegg. Um, and, you know, obviously, because of my relationship with, with Coach Ewell, it would have been great to play for him varsity like Mike did. But um, I have no complaints about Coach McKay. He was a really good guy. Uh, we were okay my junior year. I don't think we made much noise. Um, my senior year, we were pretty good. Um, you know, I was I was a good player. I wasn't a great one. Um, uh, we had a couple. Errol Robertson. I don't know if you remember that name. Yeah, he was sure. he was a good player. Mm-hmm. We ended up making it to like George Mason, which was always kind of the goal. You get into yeah. the regional finals and get to play in, in that big arena. Uh, all felt felt huge. You know, compared to high school gyms. Uh, we lost, but, you know, it was still a fun ride. And, um, you know, like Mike said, just it was fun back then. And the minute you get into college, you're, you're worried about impressing people and scouts are watching. And it's almost like you're auditioning for the NFL in college. 
Uh, whereas high school, you're just going out and playing and having fun and, and uh, you know, letting the cards land where they may. So I, I really enjoyed my, my time playing high school basketball. Like I said, I even told my Virginia Tech coaches, like, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to play basketball my senior year. And, you know, they had no issues with it. But um, I, I just I really enjoyed the sport of basketball. I just so it happens I ended up being a better football player than I was a basketball player. But for I'd say the first 15 years of my life, um, it wasn't until high school that football really like took the lead in terms of my favorite sport and what I ended up embracing. But for a while, I loved basketball and, and um, you know, probably put more of my childhood uh, practice and attention and stuff like that into basketball than, than any other sport. Mm-hmm. And, and Sean, why, why did you choose Tech, Virginia Tech? Now, um, fair disclosure, I'm, I'm a UVA guy. Um, okay. It's funny, I, uh, I've been interviewing a lot of guys lately who went to Tech. Like, I, I, sh- I sent you guys Mark Cox, and I've gotten quite a few uh, Tech football players on recently. But why, why did you end up at Tech? And um, was it because of, of Dooley? Um, uh, Bill, uh, I got his name right? Uh, Frank no, Dooley. I'm not that old. I'm not that old, Julian. Um, no, not Dooley. Uh, Frank um, Beamer. Frank Beamer. Yeah, yeah, Beamer. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think Bill Dooley retired in like 84 yeah. or something like that. So, yeah. no. Um, <laughs> so, I kind of knew I wanted to play in the ACC, or at least yeah. we grew up, uh, as mm-hmm. I, uh, we kind of mentioned briefly earlier, my uncle played for, for Duke football. And so, we grew up like Duke, like, you know, me and Mike, big Duke basketball fans. And we had – you know, just being in the region in Maryland and Virginia and North Carolina, and Duke UNC. And, um, you know, it, it, for some reason, I just wanted to play in the ACC. Now, I wasn't really nationally recruited, so my options were semi-limited to, like, the ACC and the Big East. Um, uh, it wasn't like I was getting really recruited by, like, the SEC schools. I, You know, a few Big Ten schools recruited me, but not a ton. Um, so – not only did I want to play in the ACC, but really my options were ACC or Big East in terms of the schools that actually offered me. And I went, we, we visited a lot of the schools and um, I came away the most impressed in terms of like my visit with Virginia Tech. But I, um, I remember that my, my knock against Virginia Tech was that they were in the Big East. They weren't in the ACC. And so I kind of put like UVA, um, Georgia Tech, was was uh, really enjoyed my visit there and really liked Chan Gailey and, and their program. Um, so there was a couple schools that were you know, Wake Forest I really liked. Um, anyway, long story short, Tech was like, man, I love Tech and I love the coach, the quarterbacks coach Kevin Rogers. It really wasn't Beamer, not to, I'm mean, not knocking Beamer, but the the allure in terms of the coaching staff at Tech was the quarterbacks coach Kevin Rogers at the time. Um, and then I remember uh, Mikey, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, we used to, you know, these were, were, were ancient, right? We used to read the sports section, like the physical newspaper in the morning. And I remember I came down to breakfast and Mike had like this like silly grin on his face. And it was like, hey, Sean, check out the sports section. And it said Miami VT BC to join ACC. It was like the the headline of the sports section of the Washington Post. And I, I think that ever since that moment, I was like, it was like, that's what I needed to push me over the edge to, to go to Virginia Tech. Cause I love the campus. I love that it was relatively close to home. Um, I love that it was, a, I mean, it was big time football, you know, Virginia Tech uh, at that time. I don't know if we can toot our horn about that anymore, but at that time, big time football. I really liked my recruiting coach. I loved the quarterbacks coach. Uh, I knew there was a chance Eddie was going to go there too. Um, and so that, that had an influence. And, um, like I said, the minute that they announced that they're going to be in the ACC, I, I think kind of in my head, I knew that's where I was going to end up. Yeah. And, and Mike, you did, you did a, you took a different path. Now, you know, NC, you know, NC state has never recruited a lot of players in Northern Virginia. I've never known a lot of, a lot of football players before going to state. I know a lot, UNC used to get, used to kill, um, uh, you know, they used to burn a path through these, to these towns uh, in the 70s and 80s. And then University of Maryland always recruited a lot in Northern Virginia, but state, uh, uh, not so much. So how did you end up at, North, at uh, NC State? Yeah, so I was lucky to kind of um, see Sean's experience at Virginia Tech. And basically I wanted the best path to the NFL. 
And I thought that was going to be from a someone that ran a pro style offense and had a lot of history developing quarterbacks. So Tom O'Brien was the head coach at Boston College, mm -hmm. and they were recruiting me there. And Boston College had a lot of success sending quarterbacks to the NFL. And at the time, it was Matt Ryan. Um, I wasn't super high on going up to Boston. I kind of wanted to stay near Virginia and anything probably go south. And then Tom O'Brien ended up get, leaving BC to become the coach at NC State. So it was like perfect for what I wanted. Um, only four hours from home and a pro style offense with a quarterback coach and offense coordinator that had put basically a quarterback in the NFL for the past decade at Boston College. And actually Virginia was my first offer and I was very high on Virginia. I would have gone to Virginia before Virginia Tech. Uh, Al Groh was the head coach. Mike Groh was the uh, offensive coordinator. They ran a pro-style offense. Um, and but at the end of the day, I liked NC State better, and I thought I would have a better shot at getting on the field early. They had this kind of no-name quarterback out of Richmond, two-star quarterback named uh, Russell Wilson. And I was like, ah, oh, that's fine. I'll go there and I'll, you know, I'll play as a either – really, I, I wanted a red shirt. I wanted to red shirt a year and then go on and play four years. Um, so that was the, the main reason why I chose NC State was uh, I wanted to go somewhere that would um, prepare me to get to the NFL. Yeah, now the red shirting is interesting. Uh, when I talked to Mark Cox from Tech, he was a Tech quarterback in the early '80s. He didn't even know that he was going to be that one of his early years could be counted as a red shirt year until his fifth year. They said, "Hey, you want to you want to come back? You only played two or three games." Your first year, you're still eligible, and you end up coming back and playing a, a fifth year. Um, and I see, um, I know that Sh Sean um, played a little bit his freshman year, in a red, red shirt in a sophomore year, whereas Mike, you red shirted um, um, right off. What is the best path? Is it just a matter of whatever the, the, the program needs at a particular time? Um, is, there, is there a better path? Yeah, I, I remember I was on a visit at the University of Maryland, and there was probably like 20 of us recruits in the room. Okay. And they said... Uh, how many guys want a red shirt? And I was the only one to raise my hand. Hmm. And because I learned through Sean that red shirting is good, particularly as a quarterback. I mean, the adjustment, no offense to Northern Virginia football, but the speed of the game from playing some of the kids in Northern Virginia to playing in the ACC, it was a lot. And um, I needed a red shirt year and I wanted one. Um, now I got to NC State and I was kind of in a competition right off the bat to be the starter with Russell and, kind of the uh, incumbent senior. But I think redshirting is great for your body physically, mentally, um, all, all of it. I, I think unless you are an absolute stud, I think it's beneficial to redshirt. Yeah. How about you, Sean? Do you, do you agree with that or? 100%. Uh, I'm glad I got the opportunity. I actually kind of almost forced the hand because um, so I, I, um, I was kind of thrust into a role I wasn't expecting. You know, Mike said, you know, you, you, when you're in the recruiting process, you're kind of figuring out like, all right, who's in front of me? When am I really going to get a chance to play? And uh, Marcus Vick was in, was in front of me. So I was, I was just kind of of the, you know, mindset, uh, probably the opposite of even Mike uh, in terms of like, I know I'm not playing early. I mean, freaking Vic in front of me. Um, and so my thought process was, I'm going to go down there. I'm a red shirt. I'll learn for another year behind Marcus, or maybe two. And, you know, depending on if he left for the NFL early and then I'd get my shot, my sophomore redshirt, sophomore redshirt junior year. Well, he gets suspended my first year down there for the entire season. And so uh, I ended up winning the backup role. It was me and another guy who were competing to be number two behind Brian Randall. And I think that just so like, if something were to happen to Brian, um, I had some experience, some reps that every time that there was an opportunity, like we were winning a game by a lot, you know, blowouts, or we were playing some of the, you know, Northwest, Southeastern state schools that they got me as many um, reps as possible. And so I burned my red shirt as a result of that. And I, and I kind of was on board with it. Like I, I kind of knew and, and was excited to play in those games and, and knew that if Brian ever went down, that it, I would have to go in there. So it was nerve wracking as well. But then the second year, Marcus came back, and I was same role. I won the backup job again, and but I told the coaches actually. I told them at halftime of a Duke game when they told me to get ready to go in in the second half. Like, 
uh, they were not very happy with me. I got a, a little tongue lashing like the next day when we got back, uh, like don't ever pull that S again. But um, I told him like at halftime, like, uh, <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not doing that. again. I'm not wasting another year doing that. Like I'll stay ready. I'll, I'll prepare every week as I've been the back up. But, you know, going in and handing the ball off and, and running some screens and some quick game against Duke isn't going to prepare me really anymore. And I don't want to burn another year of eligibility. And, yeah, looking back, thank, thank goodness I did um, um, because it allowed me, yeah, another year of eligibility that, it, you know, Marcus stayed healthy that whole season and I really would have essentially wasted it. So I uh, ended up getting my red shirt that year. Um, luckily, like I said, Marcus stayed healthy. Um, and yeah, like Mike said, I mean, the, the game is somewhat different. Um, and as a quarterback, I think there's some positions like, you know, Eddie Royal is a great example because he was a receiver. I think there's certain positions where you can just plug in and play the game um, if you're athletically gifted enough. But uh, not just from um, wanting to get stronger and gain weight and but I wanted to learn. I wanted to, I didn't know how to read defenses. I didn't even know what cover two, cover three, cover four was, you know, when I got to Virginia tech. So um, just another year of learning. Uh, like I said, I had a really great quarterback coach in terms of preparing. Um, I, I mean, unless you are just super gifted, I, I would recommend that 90% of quarterbacks take a red shirt. I think it's, it's beneficial. Well, one thing about the quarterback position, it's a little sacred in that you don't play more than one player there generally. I mean, there's been times in, um, when quarterbacks have been platoon, but usually you got to choose one. And colleges, you know, they tend to recruit guys that could be number one. You don't get a guy, you don't recruit a guy who's going to be a backup. You try to recruit three or four quarterbacks that, that are, are really good. And, you know, you hope one of them um, um, does indeed become very good. But what is the relationship with the quarterbacks? I mean, I mean, uh, Sean, you, you fought over that, that position for, for, for four years. And, and Mike, you did, you, uh, you waited for Russell and then, um, but in the NFL, you've had, to, there's been times when you, when you played and then inexplicably sometimes you didn't play. And then, then you get comfortable um, as, you know, you're, you're the backup and your job is going there if he gets hurt. Um, you know, what, what is the relationship between the quarterbacks when you know only one can play? I think it's a unique bond. Um, there's a, there's a competition aspect, but there's a mutual respect aspect. And then really in the NFL, I mean, as the primarily back of my whole career, my job is to be there and support that guy and have his back no matter what, because uh, there are times where you might throw a pick six and everyone in the stadium is booing you. And there's only one other guy that really knows what that feeling is like. And you have to be there to, to have their back and, um, just be there for them at, at anything. So no matter the competition, uh, like Russell, we weren't really friends off the field, but when we were in the meeting room together, there was a, uh, um, a great understanding of each other and, and a mutual respect that, you know, although we're competing, we're going to help each other out. And I've never had an issue where someone asks a question, you know, you ask a question and the person doesn't want to help you or answer you. Like that just doesn't, and at least in my experience, that, that never happened. It was always, we're going to help each other out no matter who the, who's out on the field. And uh, definitely in the NFL, my, all my closest friends have come from those quarterback rooms. Yeah. And Sean, did you have the same experience at, at Tech? Yeah. Yeah. Mike, Mike articulated that well, the unique bond, because it, it does sound weird to, to say, like, you know, the, the competitive part of you or, um, you know, the survival of the fittest part of you makes it so you think you like oh you'd have some sort of animosity towards the other quarterbacks in the room or you know doggy dog kind of thing but it's really not like that I, I guess there's like for the most part this agreed upon understanding that you know best guy will play um but I never you know my closest friends really if I you know I had to like narrow down my six or seven closest friends from Virginia Tech half of them will be quarterbacks. Um, you know, there's just something about it. Um, Corey Holt and I came in the exact same year. Um, Corey was a good player, but, you know, just never really worked out for him. And, you know, obviously things semi worked out for me, you know, and there, but we never once had a negative word. And he's probably the person I talked to the most from my Virginia tech career. Everyone, 
you know, and I'm sure Mike got it with Russell, but I got a million people being like, oh, you and Tyrod, you know, not not like you must hate each other, but like, oh, man, is it just awkward or, um, you know, do y'all just have this like unspoken tension in the air? And it was like, like, I couldn't even articulate like, no, like not at all. Um, you know, do I want to start over Tyrod? Do I want to play more than him? Of course. Absolutely. Um, am I rooting that he throws, you know, 10 touchdowns a game and no picks? No, not necessarily. But <laughs> not that good. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, I'm not necessarily at wanting him to light the world on fire, but I promise you when he was in there, I was not like, I was like, mess up Tyrod, mess up. Like, it was not like that. And we supported each other. We talked, I mean, that's who, when, when he came to the sideline after the play, he was talking to me or after a series. When I came, I was talking to him. Um, there, There is just like this unspoken uh, agreement that you're going to support each other. I mean, yeah, you hear stories of like, you know, Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre or stuff like that. But I think that's the exception more than it's the rule. Uh, I really think that there is a, a maturity a, and just an understanding in those quarterback rooms of how it works. And, and uh, like I said, my – my closest friends other than, you know, a select few have come from the court, came from the quarterback room at Virginia Tech. Well, Sean, you, you had some ups and downs at, at Tech, but you had an amazing moment when you guys won the ACC championship and, and you carried, you, uh, you ran the show that day. It, it was your team. Tell us a little bit about that moment. That must've been very special for you. It was, it was, especially because of how the year played out. So, you know, I, I played my sophomore year. I started every game and, we were good. I mean, we went 10 and two, um, we were a good team, but I, I didn't play like great. Um, I, you know, if I'm being honest, our defense kind of carried us. I was, I was an adequate quarterback. I was a solid quarterback, but nothing more than that. So the junior year was the year I wanted to elevate myself from being a, just a solid quarterback to being a good one. And, um, you know, we, the second game of the season down at LSU, we were getting just throttled and, I wasn't doing very well. And, you know, they put tire on it and it was a left hook that I just never even, I really didn't see coming and man talk about like just deflating me and my confidence, you know, thinking this was going to be my big year. And I almost got, you know, it was like a triple bogey the second hole, like the round was uh, over before it even started. And um, so for, to, to hit that low where I'm not wondering, you know, I'm wondering if, is my career at Virginia Tech over? Am I going to have to transfer? Um, you know, and, and then Tyrod started the next few games, but then he got hurt um, I probably like the fifth game of the season. And then I came in and I just went on a run. I played really good football. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, at the time I broke the record for like most passes without an interception. We were rolling, we were winning. And then to make it to the ACC championship game and get the MVP and, and be, uh, you know, ACC champs in a year where two, three months earlier, I was not even sure, you know, I'd ever play for Virginia Tech again. It, it really made it like, you know, besides maybe the high school championship, that was probably the coolest moment of my football career or the, or the one I look back on the most fondly because, it, like I said, I to to experience rock bottom and top of the mountain in a two, three month span was, was pretty, pretty unique and, and, and definitely pretty special. Yeah, it's a great career for us athletes who never made it past uh, high school. I would love to have a college career that you had, Sean. So that's amazing to win the ACC championship. So, so Mike, so you, you got a lot of great experience for, um, playing for coach O'Brien at NC state and you get drafted into NFL and then you have a fantastic uh, rookie season with Tampa. There's no other way to describe it with a team that struggled Yet you you, your statistics were unbelievable. So you had a, a pretty um, seamless adjustment to the NFL, I, w- I would think. Yeah, and I think um, kind of the, what I would go back to is why I chose NC State. Sure. That exact reason prepared me for the moment when I got the NFL. My mm-hmm. offensive coordinator in college was a guy named Dana Bible, and we ran basically a basic NFL offense. So when I got to the NFL, there wasn't a big adjustment in learning the playbook and understanding the defenses because they prepared me really well. I had a great foundation and um, yeah, really my best year in the NFL was probably my rookie year. And I think you have to give a lot of credit to my college coaches because, you know, the the NFL guys didn't have that much time with me. um, And it was really them. So kind of, as you hit on, we, uh, we weren't 
we didn't win a lot of games, but from kind of a statistic and production standpoint, that was probably the best year of my career. Yeah. Well, and then, I mean, Lovey Smith comes to, to, to Tampa and he chooses, um, I can't think of the guys. The, the yeah, guys Josh McCown. Yeah. And so you were kind of in and out. Like you did get a couple chances to play again. And then you end up settling in um, as a backup quarterback in the NFL. Had a great backup career. You've been able to come in and, and be productive when, when you have to. Maybe talk a little bit about uh, Lovey Smith that, that season. But also, probably more importantly, it's the, the life of a backup quarterback when you might go a year without even playing. And then, but you have to be ready because someone might get hurt and it's third and eight. It's raining outside. And they need you to earn that money. So um, tell us a little bit about, about that process. Yeah, so Lovey came. Um, Greg Shiano got fired after my rookie year. Lovey came in. And I thought I would um, potentially be the – I mean, I know Shiano was there. I would have been the starter, uh, kind of returning starter. But Lovey came in, and he wanted to bring in Josh McCown because he had been with him in Chicago. And I kind of thought maybe it would be somewhat of a competition, but it was not at all. Uh, Josh was the starter. Um, he got hurt after a couple games. I went in and went in and we did pretty well. Um, we got our first win of the season. And then a couple games later, he benched me, uh, which was unfortunate. But then uh, after that year, they drafted Jameis Winston. We had the first pick of the draft. And I get when you have the first pick of the draft, there's a good chance you're probably going to try to take a quarterback. So kind of that point, um, I became the backup. And uh, then I went to Chicago, got the opportunity to start, didn't play well enough there to, uh, you know, remain a starter. But um, to your question of what it's like to be a backup, yeah, you do always have to be ready. It's kind of a cliche saying that everyone says, but you do – you have to prepare like you're the starter. I mean, I watched just as much film. Um, I mean, when I have started, I probably have spent a little more attention to detail on it. But I, w I keep my same exact routine every single week from when I was starter to backup. Um, I didn't really have many of those times where you have to go in like someone got hurt. Um, that only happened to me I, once or twice. Um, but it's kind of a uh, – there's some – the uncertainty and the anxiety of not knowing if you're going to play. You know, when you're the starter, you know all week I'm going to play. When you're the backup, you just never know. and you, you, So you have to, have to be ready. Um, but I've enjoyed the role. Um, it's – been pretty you know not not exactly what I envisioned to play for as many teams of, as I have but along the way I've gotten to live in essentially every region of the country I've had hundreds and hundreds of teammates and coaches and I've just met so many people by kind of having this journeyman career so um there's you know there, there are some pros to it uh that I got to experience some things that you know some guys don't get to that kind of stick in one place um, so I've been fortunate on that side. Is there ever a process where you had this ambition? I want to be a starting quarterback for NFL to one day you're like, you know what? I can have this long career as a backup, make great money more than 98% of the Americans make. And relatively it's, it's less risk. Is there, is there a moment when you actually accept this role? I have to be uh, right Yeah, I think after, after the whole Chicago thing, um, you know, I was, uh, like you said, being a backup quarterback in the NFL is a pretty good gig. Uh, my body, luckily, I have, haven't taken that many hits. Um, I just had surgery this past offseason. That was the first surgery I've had in my entire career. Financially, it's been great for me. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been very fortunate in, um, in, in that regard. Yeah, they're worse jobs. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and then you had, you had some great moments for the Giants this year, okay? and which, which is great to, great to see you're able to deliver um you know a couple a couple yeah we had a you know a tough season prior year in jacksonville kind of similar um played better the, the previous year in jacksonville although we weren't very good uh new york was kind of a similar situation i could have definitely played better but um just all in all it was, it was a tough tough season but yeah. um, and hopefully I'll, I'll get picked up here shortly but um you know we'll see what happens if not i'm proud of what i was able to accomplish yeah, that'd be great. We'll, we'll still be cheering for you. And Sean, what, what about you? Now, you, you, at some point you had to, you tried out for the NFL, we're in some camps, but at some point you have to decide, you know, um, I, I'm going to give my football dream up and I'm going to, I'm going to get a job and do other things. Uh, what, what was that process like? It was, it was it difficult for you? 
Yeah, it was. Um, <clears throat> and I would actually, I would, I would change your wording to say, uh, only, the, only the really, really good players get to decide when their football career is over. Uh, for the rest of us, we're, we're told um, when it's over. And that's, and that's the tough part, right, is, uh, you know, Tom Brady gets to go out on his own terms and, and, yeah. decide, and, five, and times, decide, five different times <laughs> decide to stop playing football when he wants to play football. And even, even Mikey at this point in his career could make that decision. Like, okay, I'm just, I'm just done. Um, unfortunately for me, like I said, the world uh, told me I was done with football before, before I, I wanted to be done with football. So that was a tough pill to swallow. because you know, it's kind of like an identity crisis. You're, you know, I was Sean Glennon, the quarterback for, however long you know that's what I was that's what I was known for that's you know people thought of my name that's that's what they thought of like I said it was it was my brand and so all of a sudden you're a young adult and you have to rebrand yourself somehow and and be okay with that and uh you know it's definitely hurt your ego and and it's tough it's tough I I sympathize with anyone who who gives up uh, sports that they play for a long time because it's tough to like I said just kind of say all right, I'm going to, you know, take this detour in the road and, and be perfectly okay with it is, is, is hard. So yeah, I went to, I signed with the Minnesota Vikings out of, uh, uh, I went undrafted, you know, I was, I was hoping to get drafted in kind of the later rounds um, didn't happen. Signed with the Vikings mostly because I had a few opportunities to sign, but that guy I talked about earlier, my quarterback coach at Virginia tech, Kevin Rogers, he left halfway through my college career to go to the Vikings so it was, it was sort of like, you know, I'm probably a long shot to, to make a team. You know, hopefully I can make a practice squad and I'd rather go somewhere where the guy knows me and will kind of look out for me and, you know, whatever, than, than just going to a coach I've never met before. So that's why I went there. Um, you know, things didn't work out. This guy named Brett Favre decided to come out of retirement, um, join, join our team. And, you know, it was a, probably a pretty easy decision by the coaching staff of like, okay, well, who are we going to cut to make room for him? Um, you know, I was low guy in the totem pole. I was really just hoping to be practice squad. I didn't even really have any um, aspirations of making the roster. And uh, like I said, once Favre came on the team, it was just a numbers game. Uh, I went to the Ravens briefly, um, but then they signed John Beck. So I got cut and that was it. Uh, I tried, I'd ha I hung on, you know, I was stayed ready. I worked out. Uh, I had some tryouts for a league called the UFL after that. It was, it was a startup league that didn't end up working out uh, more than a few years. But um, like I said, then all of a sudden the phone stops ringing and you're not necessarily ready for it to stop ringing. You're, you know, you're wanting it to, you're still, like I said, in your mind, a football player, but yeah, at some point you have to just kind of make a grown up adult decision and say, okay, well, this obviously is going to happen. And, you know, I need to move on with my life. Um, and, you know, and I know, I know a lot of people, luckily for me, I found a, a decent job that I embraced and things went well. But, you know, I know a lot of guys, it took them years to kind of like kind of pick up the pieces and find something new. So uh, it's tough. Like I said, the biggest thing is more identity, more ego driven of like I'm a football player. And like I said, all of a sudden one day you're not. And, and coming to terms with that is, is difficult when you're young. Um, like I said, and Mike, you know, Mike just mentioned his career. Uh, might be coming to an end and you know it's probably a lot easier for him to swallow with the career he's had and at his age than when you're 23 you know uh trying to do that so uh it was tough um because I wanted to play football I really wanted and I thought I was good enough to at least have a um you know journeyman NFL career but didn't work out and uh, you know I look back now and I really don't have that like hole or, or, or any you know whatever you want to call it anymore but for a while for like a year or two um I definitely did it was it was tough yeah well look you, you know guys I'm sure Woodlands Texas will be very proud of you guys you guys you guys uh you know won a couple state championships all met all state you know played play big time college uh football you know Mike is still out there um you know chasing it and and succeeding. So, I mean, you've, you've made Fairfax County, Northern Virginia football proud. So I'm, I'm really glad I got a chance to meet you guys. Um, you know, if you're ever in town and you're playing golf with, with uh, Doug, Coach Rule, I'm not very good, but maybe if it's some kind of best ball, we're not keeping score. Uh, you know, I'd love to meet you in person because I really enjoyed this. No, thanks, thanks for having, having us. us. It's fun. Proud to uh, kind of represent Northern Virginia football and uh, always fun to kind of go back and 
check to see how Westfield's doing and, and see what other players are coming out of the region. Yeah, yeah, we're still producing great, great athletes. That's been awesome, and you guys are definitely part of that. So, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, guys, it was it was great to meet you. Thanks for doing it. I'm sorry I kept you so long, but uh, I really enjoyed talking uh, football with you guys. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, Appreciate okay. it. All right, good. Have a good day, guys. See ya.